projecting here. So this is a quarter circle graph and I'm stacking square slices on top of it. And imagine that that's an infinite number of square slices. And obviously the squares st start off small on the right. Here we go, small, and then they're growing and growing and growing as the distance between the x-axis and the curve grows and grows and grows. Do you think we could find the volume of this bizarre looking solid? I think we probably could. So pause the video and just think about, in a general way, how you could go about finding the volume of a solid that was generated this way. So keep in mind, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. And the curve that I'm starting with on the two-dimensional piece of paper is the curve f of x equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. So this is 1 minus x squared, this curve right here. And I'm stacking up square slices, if you will. Or the other way to think about it is you have this solid and you can make slices so that there are squares. How can you find the volume of this? Well, let's think about it. Let's think about it and let's try it. So we have here our, our canvas, right? And I, I'm just telling you right off the bat, I cannot draw these things very well. But I'm stacking up, here's my first square, and my second square, and my third. And there's an infinite number of squares, and imagine those squares coming off of this screen as we just saw. Don't you think that if we could find the volume of each one of those little square slices, and then if we added up all of those square slices, that would give me the volume of this three-dimensional shape? Yeah. How do we add together an infinite number of things? Using an integral, of course. So let's think about what the volume of each little slice would be. And each slice, in this case, is an infinitely thin square. You can think of it like a slice of bread, OK? Now, its thickness, its thickness is going to be my change in x. So that part is just my dx, right? That's the thickness of each individual little square piece of bread. Now, a square, we know that its length and its width are the same. You can think of it length as being the distance between these two curves, or between f of x and the origin. Oh, and then its height coming off of the screen into the third dimension here, oh, well, that's going to be the same as this because it's a square. So I think that it's going to be this distance, which is f of x squared. That's going to give me the area of that square piece of toast. And then the depth of that square piece of toast is dx. And if I add up all those infinite number of little slices of bread, I'm going to have my volume. There it is. So let's actually try that. Let's try that here with our actual function. If you recall, we are using as the base of our loaf of bread, if you will, this function, the square root of 1 minus x squared. So if that's the base of my square and the height of the square is the same, so I'm just going to square it. And then the little infinitely thin little piece of slice I can th think of as the change of x. And I'm going from 0 to 1 because 
That's where that intersects the x-axis. All right, so here I go. I'm going to first square this because that seems to be the easiest. 1 minus x squared dx. Take the antiderivative of each piece. So I have x minus 1 third x cubed from 0 to 1. That's going to give me 1 minus 1 third times 1 cubed minus 0 minus 1 third times 0 cubed. I love these numbers. That is a cube, not a 5, although I guess it doesn't matter in this case. So that's going to be 1 minus 1 third or 2 thirds. So the volume of this solid would be 2 thirds cubic units, whatever we're doing. How cool is that? Now, what if instead of each slice being a square, what if instead I said I wasn't building squares, but I was building a loaf of bread where the height was always constant? So let's say that my cross section, instead of it being a cross section of a square, which is what we did here, let's say it's the same scenario, but now my cross section is a rectangle of height four units. Okay. So now instead of having a square piece of bread, I have a rectangular piece of bread, right? My, uh, my orientation here is a little funny, but the distance between the curve and the x-axis is one dimension of my rectangle. The other dimension of my rectangle is always just going to be 4. The thickness is still going to be dx. Okay, so the volume of this different type of solid is still going to be from 0 to 1. It's still going to be my distance between my curves. But now, instead of that times itself to get the area of a square, I'm getting the area of a rectangle. I'm going to multiply that times 4. Since 4 is a constant, I'm just going to throw that out front. Boom, and there you go. And of course, you would analyze this volume. This doesn't look too, well, that does look a little annoying. I'm not going to take the antiderivative of that right now, but by hand. But let's throw that in the calculator. We can do that certainly easily. Um, but does that make sense? So each slice now is in the shape of a rectangle. I got an answer of, oh my goodness. Well, I'm going to round it to three decimal places. Wow, my answer looks enormously like pi. That is wild. Uh, cubed units, whatever my units are, since I'm finding a volume. So that would be when I have a cross section that's a rectangle. Now, I could build a solid with a cross section of any shape. Maybe it would be a semicircle. Maybe it would be a isosceles triangle. Maybe it would be an equilateral triangle. But the, your mission is always the same. You find the area of whatever your cross section is, multiply that by that dx or dy if you're doing it with respect to y to get the volume of that infinitely thin slice. Add up all the slices you have and take the integral on your interval. That's going to give you your volume. How cool! Isn't math the best? It's shiver in the dark, it's raining in the park, but meantime, it's all of the